My name is Martin Wolf. I'm the Chief Economics Commentator of the Financial Times, and it's my great pleasure and honor to moderate this panel on averting a COVID-19 debt trap with three very distinguished and knowledgeable panelists, namely Kristalina Georgieva, Managing Director of the IMF, Mohamed El Arian, who is now President of Queen's College at Cambridge University, but has had a long and very distinguished career in international finance in both the public and private sectors, and Vera Songwe, who is Under Secretary General and Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Africa of the United Nations. Um, we have been told, in fact, the IMF has just told us, that we have quite a strong global recovery, and in many ways, rather better than they expected. Things have been getting rather consistently better. But it's a very divergent recovery. They now see, the IMF seems now to feel that the high-income countries may emerge from this crisis with very little scarring. But the situation in developing countries, and particularly the poorer of them, looks much, much worse. And this is for two distinct reasons, which coming together create a real challenge. The first is, of course, that they don't have access to the vaccines, which are being rolled out quite rapidly in high-income countries. And so the pandemic is likely to last relatively uncontrolled for some years. And in addition, they've quite naturally and rightly accumulated substantial debt during the crisis. There has been no debt crisis so far because of the support they've received from the official sector and, in fact, private sector willingness to lend. But large amounts of debt have accumulated, and this creates a very severe vulnerability, which we're going to address in this panel. I intend to divide the discussion into two main segments. The first will look at what is the danger of a COVID-19 debt trap, and the second will focus on what has to be done to avert such a tra debt trap, what institutional and other changes are needed to make sure this doesn't happen, this nightmare outcome doesn't happen. So first, may I ask if you, if the, um, if the results of the first poll, we have two polls, which are very interesting, um, uh, LinkedIn polls. Um, uh, and I wonder if the first one could be shown, which focuses on the debt worries. Well, I think this is rather startling. It's pretty clear that of the people who answered the polls, and I think it was a large number, the number who are extremely worried is almost half, and the number that is somewhat worried is another 30%. So it's clear that this is a, an enormously important and disturbing topic, and I believe rightly so. So let's start by looking at the dangers, the, the risks we now face as we come out of this crisis. Uh, so how well have countries coped so far? Who is most vulnerable to debt distressed? And what sort of events, interest rates, uh, spikes, exchange rate fluctuations, financial shocks, something else might trigger such debt crises? I wonder if I could start with you, uh, Kristalina Georgieva. Thank you very much for uh, moderating this uh, panel. And you put the discussion in the right perspective. We have some good news, but we also see danger, danger in divergence in uh, economic fortunes of advanced economies and developing economies. Uh, so why are people worried of uh, a potential debt problem? They have reason to be worried. We entered the pandemic with high level of debt. And during this year and five months since we are in it, Understandably, debt levels went further up. Why? Because revenues went down and expenditures went up. Today, public debt globally is reaching 100% of GDP. Within this, advanced economies have jumped the most, nearly 20%. Emerging markets, nearly 10%. Low-income countries, 5%. One may say, well, aren't the advanced economies in a more difficult situation? And the answer is no, 
because they have much higher capacity to carry on debt and because highly accommodative uh, policies plus significant fiscal support has buffered them. Whereas many emerging market economies with weaker fundamentals and by and large the low income countries are faced with a very dramatic situation. That is, they have very limited fiscal space. In fact, advanced economies provided 24% to GDP equivalent to boost, uh, to, to protect their, their businesses and households. Low income countries, 2% of a very small GDP. On top of it, they have now a significant portion with debt difficulties. 56% of low income countries are either at a high risk of debt distress or already in debt distress. Uh, many of them uh, have economies that are structurally more severely hit by the crisis, tourism dependent uh, economies. And uh, when we look at the risks in front of them, of this category of countries, uh, we are concerned of two risks. The first one is because their vaccinations are slower, their capacity to recover is smaller, they're going to lag in years behind advanced economies unless we act very strongly to support them. What does it mean for countries with high debt level? They fall in a debt trap. They cannot generate enough growth to bring down debt levels and these debt levels hold them back. And that is very real for many of these countries. The second risk I see on the horizon is good news for some turning into bad news for others. If an accelerated recovery, for example, in the United States pushes up interest rates and we actually have seen a glimpse of that just this last month in the last weeks, then the fate of these countries in terms of debt burden is going to be incredibly difficult. So when we are, when we are faced with this situation, what is the, the uh, path forward? Obviously, first and foremost, help these countries recover faster. <laughs> so we talk about that, but we should talk about vaccines as well. Make sure that they have more grants, more concessional financing in support, uh, and of course, bring down their debt level. Uh, we will talk about that later, what more can be done, but we had the debt service suspension initiative, it helped some. We had the common framework, it has to help more. We had at the IMF, we uh, brought debt relief for 29 poorest members, they don't pay us during this crisis. And so now we have a chance during these meetings to boost reserves through a new allocation of special drawing rights. We have to look at all instruments at our disposal. It has to be a comprehensive support for countries and countries themselves have to step up by mobilizing resources domestically, collect taxes uh, uh, better, by making sure that they create good conditions for private sector. In other words, all hands on deck. And then we can sleep without the worries of a debt crisis. So thank you very much. That set out a concerning picture. Um, Mohamed Alerium, um, how far do you see the same picture and where might you differ? And what particularly, more concretely, are your big concerns in terms not only of the debtors, but also the creditors, the creditors who are less transparent, whose pictures we don't know, because the, the profile of creditors seems to me to have changed quite profoundly in the last couple of decades um, uh, since we had well, the last really large set of developing country debt crises were in the late 90s. You will remember, it's quite a long time ago. So tell us a little bit about who we should worry about now. 
Thank you, Martin. And let me just say how thankful I am to participate in this panel. I want to thank Kusilina um, and all my colleagues at the IMF. Look, you mentioned the debt crisis of the 90s. I remember being at the IMF in the debt crisis of the 80s. Um, I was working on Latin America. And I learned then a very simple framework that I will use to address your question. There's basically four ways of avoiding a debt trap. And you want to avoid the debt trap because it feeds on itself. The higher the debt, the more it sucks out the growth momentum. The less there is growth momentum, the bigger the problem of the debt. So, so you need to deal with something. Now, we know that the best solution to this is higher growth. And that remains by far the most desirable solution. <laughs> but as Cecilia just said, we also have to recognize that developing countries are facing significant headwinds. Tourism isn't going to come back quickly. Remittance flows aren't going to come back quickly. FDI is going to become remain uncertain. And all this is happening in the midst of the pandemic. So there is no easy growth path out of this in the short term. The second possibility is simply austerity. That is hard. It's very hard during pandemic times. And let's not forget that there is still an incredible priority for relief, lives and livelihoods. The setback to poverty has been substantial, and we've got multi-year shortfalls in social sectors, education, health. So don't look to austerity. And that's even before we talk about building back stronger, fairer, and greener. The third way is the old-fashioned way of either directly or indirectly taxing creditors and subsidizing debtors, what's called financial repression. That doesn't work in most developing countries. The policy flexibility is limited, which leaves timely rearrangements of debt, timely restructurings. And this is where the problem has occurred. Martin, you've talked about transparency, how the, the, the composition of debtors has changed, and we're only catching up now with that. And there's other issues that have made this difficult. There's been other issues that have made this constructive and preemptive debt reorganization difficult. It hasn't come from the official side mostly. OSI, what we term official sector involvement has been very high. PSI, private sector involvement, has not. So Christelina talked about the DSSI. She has spoken about what the IMF and the World Bank has done. I can tell you that private creditors are very excited about the SDR allocation because the inclination right now in the private sector is to free ride, free ride on OSI. So when you look back on that, the way we avert a debt crisis is through one and four, promoting growth more and ensuring better burden sharing in order to construct a better timely and constructive rearrangements of debt obligations so that the debt overhang doesn't crush it. And if it does, dispersion will become worse, inequality will become worse, and this disconnect between finance and the real economy is not going to persist and it's going to get resolved through more market volatility. Thank you. May I ask just very, very quickly a follow-up question? As you said, uh, in the 80s, we had a catastrophic debt crisis, which led to what was called the lost decade. Do you fear that something comparable could happen now? and possibly to even more countries? Yes, I do. I fear that we may face a lost decade to a set of countries in Africa and in Asia in particular. Yes, I do. Well, that's very sobering and important. So that leads me to you, Vera, uh, Vera Songwe. Um, you have a particular interest, of course, obviously, in Africa. Uh, um, so what is your perspective on uh, the situation um, in the countries you're particularly concerned about, but more broadly on the severity of this debt problem and um, 
whether in fact there is a a real danger that if something quite urgent is not done, we could be confronting a long-term economic and social disaster. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. But before I start, let me uh, thank Kristalina and the IMF uh, for having me here. Thank you very much. This is a very important uh, conversation. And I just want to build on all the work that Kristalina uh, uh, and the IMF have, has done as well to say that, yes, there is, I think, a huge risk of a debt trap. And uh, let me talk about three things, and just building up a little bit on what uh, Mohammed also said. In 2010, uh, we had a debt to GDP levels on the continent of about 42%. Uh, they actually improved in 2015 to 33%. Today, we're at 65 so clearly, I think if anybody wants to think about the numbers, and are we really, the IMF normally thinks of debt to GDP at 60% as having hit the limit. We're at 65 continentally from North Africa all the way down to South, Southern Africa. But something has changed, and I think that's what Mohammed was talking about, is essentially the composition of the debt. In 2000, we had sort of 80-20. 80% 80 of the debt was mostly concessional multilateral debt, 20% bilateral and some private. Today we have 30, 30, 40. So 40% 40 private sector debt on the continent. And this debt has been useful because for some economies it has helped them grow and grow much faster than others. 30% bilateral debt uh, with a few new big entrants coming into the market like China and Saudi Arabia uh, taking that space. And then 28% on the concessional side. So as we begin to talk about debt restructuring, we must have a framework that brings everybody together. The DSSI, the Debt Service Suspension Initiative, which Kristalina spoke about, has been great. It's given uh, the continent five billion. That's the only liquidity that we've been able to get in addition to the huge amounts of resources that we've gotten from the multilateral sector and primarily uh, the IMF, the World Bank and the African Development Bank. But that has not been nearly enough. And one of the big issues around the DSSI was we lacked private sector participation. And so we do need to find some way of seeing how we get private sector participation to the table. Otherwise, I think there's going to be a long debt trap because as we have seen with many countries who have you know, announced, yes, I want to do some restructuring, the minute they fear that they would lose market access, they close back. Mm -hmm. But I think I have talked a lot about the numbers. We talk about the, you know, 65% debt to GDP, um, you know, 40% in the private sector hands. But we do have 170 million people that are going to fall into poverty. And I think that is the conversation. It's not so much of a debt trap. It's a poverty trap or a doubling down of the poverty trap. And in Africa in particular, when you fall into poverty, you fall much further down and you stay much longer. So the question really is, can we afford to let this many people fall so deep down and for so long? When you look at, as Kristalina said, almost 27% of liquidity has been injected into the developed countries. The comparative, comparable resources that are needed to ensure that the emerging economies don't fall that deep is not as great. And so I think that there is a lack of a sense of urgency about, you know, how far. It's the SMEs in our, on, on the continent in Africa, but I think in South Asia and in Latin America that are suffering the most. And we need to find some ways of getting to them quickly. And as Mohammed said, you know, lives and livelihoods. Livelihoods are totally devastated, and we must think about that. So the DSSI, I think, is important. Another thing about this crisis is vulnerability. Who is more vulnerable? Mohammed talked about tourism and Kristalina as well. Tourism is hitting Seychelles. Tourism is hitting Morocco. So there's a group of vulnerable middle-income countries that are actually the engines of growth for some of the low-income countries on the continent. And if we cannot support those vulnerable middle-income countries, it will also be, I think, they, you have large poverty, a debt trap that you cannot get out of a la Argentina, I think which is going to make at least the African continent a lot more difficult. So the SDRs, great idea. We hope also that we will get some on lending so that we can continue to help the poorest, but also that the middle-income countries get access to some liquidity and markets can reopen for them as well. Thank you. So let's move on now, having laid out a, quite a disturbing picture, it has to be said, given the obvious problems of growth, which Mohammed uh, has emphasized, and the, um, the difficulty in that situation of doing anything that doesn't avoid some sort of debt restructuring and the difficulty of doing that. So let's focus on that now, the balance of the discussion. Before we do that, let's look at the the second poll, which actually addresses 
precisely this sort of question. The, the basic conclusion here is very much um, Mohammed's uh, conclusion um, that uh, um, that it is absolutely essential that uh, um, um, if they, they if they can manage their debt properly, um, they will have higher economic growth, room to respond to shocks. They will have lower and stable inflation, more finance to spend. That, in other words. Um, if they can manage their debt properly, life will be completely different. But this sort of looks a bit like a chicken and egg problem, doesn't it? Uh, the the difficulty being uh, they already have a lot of debt. It's already difficult to manage it. So they have to get to this point by doing something. So let me start with you, if I might ask, Vera. You, um, Given where the countries you're particularly concerned with are now, and given the likely developments and put to one side the obvious urgency, which I've written a lot about, of, of accelerating the vaccination program, making it a genuinely global program, put that aside for the moment. What would you like to see happen now to make this problem more manageable? What has to be done in terms of pulling everybody together into the discussion, making preemptive um, changes which will really allow us to avoid, allow the world to avoid the sort of nightmarish debt traps you've outlined, particularly in low-income countries. So what what has to be done and by whom and now? I think three things. Thank you very much. And, and I'm glad that uh, growth is the answer there. People do want to work and we do need a productive economy. But the first thing we really need to do is liquidity. I think Mohammed started by saying, let me learn from the past or the Argentina crisis. What happened in this crisis is that the developed world, the advanced economies learned from the past. And within the first three months of the crisis, $7 trillion of liquidity was put into the economies to just ensure that we do not fall. That sense of urgency has not been demonstrated in the emerging economies. And so the more we wait, as Kristalina said, the less revenue, the lower the GDP, the higher the debt. And so we're creating this debt trap. So liquidity now, now, I think at this uh, meetings, we're going to be announcing the SDRs. I hope we're not just announcing them. I hope we are releasing them. We can't wait for another four months before they are released. We need them yesterday. So that's the first thing is we have new liquidity, release it immediately according to the quarters. Then we can talk about the on lending. I think the second thing that we need to do is better transparency. It's going to be very difficult to work on resolving the debt problem if we do not understand who has what debt way. Yes, I gave the 30, 30, 40 number, but when you start unpacking it, it becomes very difficult, particularly in the bilateral space, to just understand what bilateral is really concessional and what bilateral is private. So we do need to understand that so that more countries can have access to the different frameworks, either the DSSI, the Debt Service Suspension Initiative, or go to the Common Framework and begin a quick and speedy debt resolution. We've seen that Ecuador did it, and it's doing it well. And finally, the third thing that needs to happen is that the markets, the private sector, needs to come to the table. We have seen Benin, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana go to the markets. But have they gone to the markets at the right cost? You know, it's one thing to have access to liquidity today, but then to unravel in a few more months. So we must look at the global architecture and see when you have lower for longer interest rates, and yes, they may be inching up, but compared to 7.5% of Ghana last week, I think that we can still do better in reducing some of the cost of market access. And finally, multilateral development institutions need capital to be recapitalized, but also to lend, not resubstitute resources, but lend new resources quickly, particularly to the lowest uh, uh, low income countries. So four things must happen. First of all, I think SDRs release yesterday. Second, uh, we do need more transparency so that we can understand how you resolve the debt. Third, we need the private sector to come to the table and come to the table both in terms of reducing market access because countries are still going to need to go to the markets. And finally, recapitalization of the MDB so that we get uh, additional resources out quickly. Well, that's a very interesting program. Let me turn to you, Mohammed, before I ask Kristalina how she's going to fix all this. 
Um, I think you talked about the fr the free riding problem, which is obvious. There are two potentially important free riders, and since you're not running a major institution, you can be frank about both of them. Uh, um, the first, of course, is uh, uh, the private sector. Um, I have to say that, uh, to me, having watched this story for half a century, the scale of the increase in private sector debt to some very vulnerable African countries strikes me as pretty irresponsible, though I understand why they took it. Um, but are they going to be, is it possible to bring them into this discussion? Because this has become increasingly difficult, the more diverse the number of private sector creditors has become. It was much easier, but it was very hard when it was, you know, 15 major banks. Now it's vastly more diverse uh, in the private sector. And then there's a new official creditor, um, an enormous superpower, China. We can't just pretend it isn't there. And so all of these institutions have to be brought together with the IFIs and the official established official creditors in an organized way. It's a completely new architectural problem. Can we get our arms around this in the sort of time period we're talking about? Martin, that is the key issue, and we have to do all we can to get our arms around this quickly. Why? In the short term, you will channel official resources to private creditors and to some extent to Chinese entities who are not participating in burden sharing. And that would be really ironic that by by being by standing back and not doing your part to solve this collective challenge you end up being rewarded and i worry about the sei allocation ending up in that way in certain countries so that's the sh that's the, that's the immediate problem the longer term problem is that if we're not careful we're going to stumble towards a multiplying paradigm of non payments and what happens in non-payments in this environment, where a lot of non-specialized creditors have lent to emerging markets, is that contagion risk goes up. So yes, we have to get around, our arms around it. Now, growth, I want to stress, it, it is key, absolutely key to this whole process. But this is a panel about debt. So let me focus on the debt. What are we trying to solve for? We're trying to solve first and foremost for better alignment of incentives between debtors and creditors, between official and private creditors, within the official creditors, Paris Club, China, and other non-Paris Club, and then within the private sector. So there's a whole host of alignments that need to be made so that incentives, so that it's an incentive compatible system. Second, we have to embed this in the structure. Because if you don't do that, the incentive will be simply to run out the clock. Third, transparency is key. We're starting to have a better understanding of the challenges. Um, the academic side has done some, some really good work on, 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 on the China issue, and we're learning a lot from that. But greater transparency is really important. And how do we achieve all this? And that's where I'm gonna end, is by converging existing bottom-up with existing top-down to create a better architecture. Existing bottom-up is the debt service suspension initiative that Kristalina mentioned that needs to be extended in time and expanded in coverage. And it needs to be supported by much greater data sharing. And then from the top-down is taking the common framework which is well-designed, is simply the extrapolation from a Paris Club process that has worked well, and making it operational in a sense where the private sector feels that it is part of it, it can influence outcomes as long as it is part of that outcome. And part of that will require using a stick. The carrot, in my opinion, but that's open to discussion, the carrot will not be enough to overcome the coordination problems within the private sector for the reason you've cited, that we will need to impose more of a stick in the system. 
Let me end up by saying there is a bit of complacency in right now. Yes, we have avoided multiple debt crises um, since the pandemic hit. In fact, the major restructurings really have been to do with pre-existing conditions. One reason is because we flooded the system with liquidity that in fact made the debt problem worse. But let's also remember two lessons from the 2008 debt crisis, the global financial crisis. One is that the IMF support peaked in 2011, not 2009, not 2010. These things take time. They often are in the shadow, the problems, and then they erupt. And by the time they erupt, it's much harder to solve. The second lesson, I keep on repeating this, and you've heard me say it, Martin, let's not think we can win a war and, and again lose the peace. This is a golden opportunity to make more sustainable and fairer lots of things. And the debt, the international debt architecture is a critical component of that. Thank you. These are very, very important points, uh, Vera. So this is for you, Kristalina. Um, uh, let's step back just for a second. As you know very well, almost 20 years ago, the then uh, Deputy Managing Director of the IMF, um, Anne Kruger, put forward the idea of a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism, which was not accepted at that time. Great pity. We, I, I and we supported it very strongly. But it seems to me something on this line, something quite fundamental needs to be considered. Um, it's inescapable. And maybe now is the opportunity. You've got a, obviously a different constellation of political forces right now in the world. Um, let's be, I can say this, the US is obviously acting in a very different way. Um, you have a shared problem, which I think everybody in the world recognizes which is a very high priority. I mean, morally and in every other way, uh, in, in avoiding the sort of nightmare we've been talking about. Um, we have an extraordinarily more complex set uh, of um, creditors and instruments, which really can only be dealt with through a global mechanism of some kind. Um, is it now the time to really push hard for something quite fundamentally transformative at the institutional level. And if we don't do that, we are just not going to be able to handle this. And what should that look like? Well, I, um, I listened very carefully to Vera and to Mohammed, and uh, I agree uh, virtually point by point with what they have said. Uh, it is regrettable that when the world was simpler and the debt problems were involving a smaller cast of characters, the then deputy managing director of the IMF was not able to push through what could have been a fundamentally different approach to debt resolution. What we see today is three big problems. One, both Vera and Mohammed talked about transparency. And there I feel very strongly that my institution has a responsibility to press very hard and uh, together with others, with the World Bank and others, to make it so that this mountain of debt that is often hidden from the naked eye can be exposed, that contracts are disclosed, and the conditions in this contra contract, sometimes ridiculous, are for everybody to see. On that, I have a bit more hope that the situation now is becoming difficult to a point that countries that have been resisting transparency and actually on both sides are more open. This is a fundamental component. If we don't know what we're talking about, we can't fix it. Two, we have gotten last year, because of the crisis, 
a new momentum for creditors to come together. Crisis is an opportunity, and that was the case in 2020. The common framework that uh, Mohammed talked about is actually our first real chance to bring the cast of ca characters, all the creditors. And my determination uh, is that we make it stick. We have three countries that have asked for a treatment under the uh, common framework, Chad, Ethiopia, and Zambia. If we, not, if we don't move, and actually on Chad, we are very, you may have heard that, we expect the Creator Committee to be formed um, within, within the next week. We have to demonstrate that we can get all the participants, traditional um, uh, creditors, um, the, um, uh, the new creditors, and it's not just China, we have China, we have India, we have Saudi Arabia, we have Turkey, they need to be in different countries, in different uh, compositions. They, they need to be uh, brought in. And we have private sector. And if we are able to make it so that these are precedents of serious engagement where we use a bit of <laughs> pressure to make sure that things are done, then obviously the, uh, the uh, common framework would just fiddle away without consequences. We cannot afford that. And then comes the third and very important uh, uh, component. And it is how we get the uh, capacity of improvements in the international debt architecture be supported by those without whom we cannot move. There is no way we can move without the big creditors, whether it's China or it is the private sector. If, if we don't bring them in, it is very hard to have anything sustainable. And there my take is the following. It is for countries to believe that they are better off because they called for uh, early for that treatment. Uh, and I am uh, looking at uh, Vera, we need to get countries to have the guts to step up early because the earlier we act on that restructuring or that reprofiling, re the better chance we have that the country would return to sustainable uh, growth. Uh, and finally, there are many elements, I mean, just to be fair, there have been good things done like uh, collective action clauses. This is a good thing. But there is so much more we can improve. And Mohammed, I may be slightly uh, on a different page than you. I think there are many elements of qualitative improvement in the international debt architecture that, that we have to pursue. Um, uh, the, DS, the DSSI, Debt Service Suspension Initiative, showed something very interesting. You can have in a contract a clause that says if a country is hit by a natural disaster, autom automatically it stops that service for a period of time. We have to work on, uh, on all these different uh, uh, parts. And, and the one thing we cannot afford is what Mohammed rightly pointed to, and it is complacency. We cannot afford it because if we are not m moving on all these fronts and bringing attention and participation in a way that makes a difference for countries. So countries then are committed to move uh, with us. Uh, then we are risking uh, to have a, um, a very unfortunate repetition of what history already told us happens when countries fall in a debt trap. We only have a couple more minutes and um, uh, um, because I think this is a very short discussion. So I, I just have one question for Mohammed and one for Vera, but you might also add any other further final thought. The question for, for Mohammed is, do there have to be further changes in domestic law or the form of contracts governing the private sector's lending to developing and emerging, and emerging countries? Um, or have we basically got a workable framework with the collective action clauses for the private sector now? And if they, we do need such changes, what would they have to be? 
so the changes you're talking about is basically to make a restructuring and particularly a preemptive restructuring easier. Um, and that would certainly help. Less problematic anyway. Sorry? Less problematic anyway. Anyway, but they will take a very long time and they will not solve this problem. Um, I think that when you look at the elements of this problem, and I completely agree with, with Castilian, we're much better off that we have CACs. Um, we have had a few attempts at private credit coordination. So there are good things happening, but I suspect that so far the carrot, which is the approach that has been taken to the private sector until we implement the common framework. And these three cases are going to be absolutely key, um, it, starting with Ethiopia. But until we, we have a track record on the common framework, I do not think the carrot works well enough. And that is because people, while they recognize at some high level that collectively everyone's better off, the incentive to free ride is, is enormous. So I think we're going to have to have more of a stick approach, Martin. And that stick approach, we actually have the tools for that. It just re requires that some of the elements of the SCRM, not actually the SCRM itself, but some of the elements of the SCRM be applied in practice. Okay. According to my um, watch, we, we have to wind this up now. There are so many fascinating and important issues on this uh, incredibly significant question. I think we are at a point in world history at which a new approach has to be taken with a new structure of debt in the, in the, in the context of what looks like being a gathering global crisis. The action has to be preemptive because crucially growth has to be sustained. We can't have years of debt, um, debt hindered or debt crippled growth. So we have to act now. Um, the SDR um, 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 agreement on uh, a new issuance of SDRs is very promising, um, but it's not clearly not going to be enough. And I think the world's leaders have to understand the, the, the sheer scale of the challenge they now confront, and they have to act urgently. And that is, I think, what comes out of this. And ultimately, that's going to depend on the major governments. Um, and I think with that, I have to thank the, the panelists for a wonderful discussions, discussion and say goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you, Vera. Thank you. Right. Think they can hear us anymore? They cannot hear us anymore. I think you guys can talk. Oh, we can talk. I can. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was great. Uh, what I want.